into the review of the Auditor General Act, hearing from the Auditor General and representatives of the Australian National Audit Office. And I now declare open the public hearing of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit in reference to the review of the Auditor General Act and would like to thank all witnesses for being present here today. Can I ask that media present may cover today's proceedings on the condition that cameras neither film nor take photos of the private papers or laptops of committee members, secretariat and witnesses, and the reporting of proceedings be fair and accurate. And I now call representatives of the Australian National Audit Office and ask that for the Hansard record, you please state your names and the capacity in which you appear before the committee. Uh, and perhaps we might do that in order from right to left your way. Jane Mead, Group Executive Director, Professional Services and Relationships Group. Thank you. Grant Hare, Auditor General. Rona Mellor, Deputy Auditor General. Uh, Tommy Wanu, Group Executive Director, Performance Audit Services Group. I thank you all. These hearings are formal proceedings of the Parliament. The giving of false or misleading evidence is a serious matter and may be regarded as a contempt of the Parliament. The evidence given today will be recorded by Hansard and attracts parliamentary privilege. Would you like to make an opening statement before we move to questions from the committee? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Auditor General. Um, good morning, Chair and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee today as part of the review of the Auditor General Act. The Auditor General Act has served the Parliament and the public well since it came into effect in 1998 and has been amended over time. This inquiry is a timely opportunity to consider improvements that could be made to the Act to reflect developments in public administration over the last decade. The ANO's submission of 27 November 2020 outlined potential amendments to the Act that could be made in response to each of the JCPAA's terms of reference, while noting a number of provisions that have been effective and amendments to those provisions may risk reducing the effectiveness of the ANAO. These provisions are discussed in my correspondence to the Chair on page one of the submission. There are four key issues in the submission which are considered to be most important. Um, the independence of the Auditor General and resourcing, the operation of section 37 of the Auditor General Act, the Auditor General's mandate and capacity to initiate audits, and the application of parliamentary privilege to the Auditor General's information gathering powers and ANAO documents. Um, with respect to the independence of the Auditor General and resourcing, um, the importance of the connection between Auditor General independence and the ability to provide effective assurance to Parliament has long been recognised by the JCPAA and its predecessor committees, as well as internationally through resolutions of the United Nations General Assembly. Independence is the key overarching theme of the submission and some of the most important issues raised by the ANEO by the ANO relate directly to independence. In the Australian system, the ANAO forms part of executive government which it audits. This could represent an independence risk, including as the ANAO is subject to the policies and processes of executive government which it is required to audit. The submission recommends JCPAA consideration of whether the governance framework of the ANAO can be amended to better support ANAO independence, such as by making the ANAO a <coughs> parliamentary department. The process for setting the budget is another key issue when considering independence and the ability of the Auditor General and the ANAO to perform their functions. The submission recommends that the JCPAA consider if its role in setting the ANAO's budget is appropriate. The submission also recommends that the JCPAA consider whether the appointment mechanisms for the Auditor General can be conducted in a way which further enhances the perception of Auditor General independence. Appointment issues also arise if the ANAO were to become a parliamentary department. With respect to section 37 of the Act, um, the fundamental principles behind section 36 and 37 are appropriate. The Auditor General receives unrestricted access to information and sections 36 and 37 balance that unrestricted access by ensuring that the Auditor General and ANAO must handle that information in confidence and cannot disclose information where it may be contrary to the public interest to do so. Section 37 does this in a way that does not undermine the independence of the Auditor General by including a public interest test which is applied by the Auditor General. 
As a further safeguard, the Attorney General may require the Auditor General to admit particular information from a report in a way in which case the information not, may not be disclosed to Parliament by the Auditor General or ANAO. That said, the Executive Government's first use of Section 37 in 2018 was expansive. It prevented the disclosure of ANAO analysis and part of the Auditor General's overall audit opinion on the value for money of defence procurement of the Hawkey vehicles for the Army. The certificate issued by the Attorney General was not restricted to preventing public disclosure of particular sensitive information which was otherwise prohibited from public release. The issues were considered by the committee during its inquiry into the Hawkey certificate and in JCPWA report 478 released in April 2019. Foremost amongst these issues was the impact of the executive's use of section 37 on the Parliament's ability to hold the Executive to account, given the effect of its use on the independence and transparency of the Auditor General reporting to Parliament. The Committee recommended in that report that these issues, including those raised in the ANAO's submission to that particular inquiry, be considered in the context of this legislative review. The restrictions which apply when the Auditor General uses Section 37 are also significant. For example, if the Auditor General decides to exclude information from a report under Section 37, they are prohibited from disclosing that information to Parliament, even in a confidential briefing. This has led me to be very reluctant to use the provision. Turning to mandate issues, the ANAO submission proposes that the Committee consider a number of issues relating to Auditor General's mandate. Changes to funding mechanisms within government pose challenges where mandate has been limited. There are two issues which have come up recently. Um, one relates to the Auditor General's authority to initiate performance audit of um, Commonwealth controlled government business enterprises. Uh, this was recommended by the JCPWA in its last review of the Act. Um, there's also a technical gap in the Auditor General's mandate where entities jointly controlled by Commonwealth entities fall outside the Auditor General's mandate and I believe this should be resolved. There is also an opportunity to extend the Auditor General's mandate to undertake mandatory audits of performance statements following the completion of the current pilot of assurance audits. Uh, this was recommended by the JCPWA in report 469. Turn to parliamentary privilege. It's long been the practice that parliamentary privilege applies to the Auditor General's information gathering powers and ANAO de generated documents as they relate to making a report to Parliament. This practice is based on consultation with the current and former clerks of the Senate and legal advices from the then Solicitor General Stephen Gaglia and Professor Dennis Pearce. More recently, issues of parliamentary privilege have arisen, including in the Parliament, and therefore the submission makes recommends that the JCPWA consider amendments to the Act to clarify the matter for the avoidance of doubt. Uh, we're happy to take any questions on the submission or any other matters. Auditor General, thank you very much uh, for that fulsome summary of, a, um, a, of your submission, and uh, we appreciate you outlining uh, the issues that you have raised. I will just flag, before I invite questions from members, we'll just indicate that we anticipate a number of public hearings. There's a lot in uh, your submission as well as other submissions, so thank you very, very much. Are there questions from members on the committee? Sure. Deputy Chair. Um, perhaps to start with, to go to the first sort of significant issue you raised around independence. Um, uh, paragraph 18 of your submission talks about um, a decline in the overall independence scores in these, the, the rankings between, is it all of the state and territory um, and national auditors generals in Australia and New Zealand? Yeah. So how many, how many does that cover? Ah, oh, well, it's New Zealand, all of the states and the, and the Commonwealth. Right, so eight, nine, ten. Yeah. yeah. So, so over the last few years, we've fallen out of ten from sixth to seventh. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, uh, an aggregate measure of independence, um, which seems a bit concerning for the Commonwealth, which some of us might think should be setting the preeminent standards and trying to be up in those top few. Can you sort of summarise why do you think we've fallen? Is it because others have just improved and this is our chance to play leapfrog by fixing some things up? I think it's we haven't gone backwards as much as others have gone further forward in right. recent I mean, So we've sort of stagnated, so this this is our ten year chance, chance to actually to make a few changes and yes. 
that's sure. related to that. Um, Auditor General, what, in your view, have others um, has happened to help others leapfrog, if you like, or go forward? What are some of those? Um, what are some of those steps, or, or, or pro what's the progress? Could you outline that, please? Um, I'll just direct your attention to the report that's in the appendix to our submission. Um, and starting from page seven of that report, um, it works through what some of the amendments have been um, since this first report was first commissioned in 2009. So um, a number of the states have um, made a number of significant amendments in relation to their mandate, for example. Um, and also in relation to um, some of the aspects of appointment of the Auditors General and the like. So there's a, a summary in the, the report that works through what some of those matters have been. Um, and then each section of the report works through where the differences are between the Commonwealth and the states um, in terms of Mandate is, I think, one of the large areas where our score is significantly lower than, than some of the states. Um, is probably one of the, the key areas. So mandate. In terms of, I think, some of um, the aspects that the Auditor General outlined in relation to um, some of the areas where there's gaps in the legislation, where so we like don't GBS have a mandate. performance statements. Yes, so those. performance audits of um, GBEs, um, performance statement audits, um, and then some of the the technical issues that the Auditor General referred to in terms of um, jointly controlled entities, joint ventures, etc. Okay. Um, can I just pick up two yeah, things? Of and course, I, and, then, and then Senator Sullivan. So one, one of the significant um, suggestions that you're putting forward is that um, the committee may recommend that the audit office gets recreated as a parliamentary department. Just check I've got this understanding right, because it's a very arcane and slightly complex thing. So you're an officer of the parliament. That was a change made about 20 years ago. Yeah. That's one hat, but you're also wearing another hat. You're the boss of the audit office yep. under the Public Administration Act, the GPA Act. And the audit office is not part of the parliament, even though you are. Um, I'm a statutory appointment with uh, the title of an officer of the parliament, which doesn't carry with it much other than a, a title, really. The ANAO is uh, a executive entity established under the PGPA uh, Act with employment under the Public Service Act. So the key difference with parliamentary departments is that the employment of staff is under the Parliamentary Services Act. Um, and where that comes has impact is that the the ability of directions to be made with respect to my staff from the public service commissioner. Um, now, it's a subtle difference in that the um, parliamentary services commissioner, who is the same person, has the same sort of direction making powers, but they've got a different hat on when doing it. The second component of it is because we sit in, as part of the executive, we sit within the Prime Minister's portfolio and we have a executive minister where parliamentary departments sit within the parliament and the uh, speaker and president effectively take the ministerial role. <coughs> and so, so if, if that change was made, then there'd be consequential changes. So the president and the speaker would bring forward your budget bids to yeah, government, the, not the, the Prime yeah, Minister? Yeah. Um, and would you still be subject to direction by the finance minister? Would you be forced to use the government shared services that you also then have to audit? Or would those conflicts get resolved? Uh, not clear. Um, as it stands, we don't um, follow the shared services uh, dilemma because it is a dilemma. Um, whether or not there are directions to the parliamentary services departments to do things, we would be caught in those. Yep. Um, I think the, the strongest issue for us is, is not only the mechanics of it all, but the appearance of it all. Right. Um, at the moment, we sit within executive government and yet we serve the parliament. And an option is that we sit closer to the parliament through the uh, governance arrangements of parliamentary departments. So you've said in paragraph 31 that this is an important consideration, I'll quote you, as independence comprises both independence of mind and independence Correct. in appearance. Yes. yes. 
Steve. Okay, the final final question I've so got. Just to add, sorry. There are. Sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah. The, some of the issues around policies of government we get through through agreement. So um, the, the executive government would put out a policy, say, on um, shared service, and we'll go to finance and say, we can't go into that because we're going to audit it, and it's a breach of sort of auditing standards for us to be a, for people to be able to audit their own payroll functions and things like that. So we, we generally work through it all. Um, I think we wouldn't have to work through it all as regularly if, if, the, if the appearance of us being different was better in that but respect. I, I mean, if, uh, I did read a bit of the 10-year review 10 years ago, mm -hmm. nerdy stuff. Um, and back then, there were a number of things that that review and the committee then thought could never happen that have since come to pass. For instance, two years ago, and you refer to this, um, you wanted to update this committee, given that's your obligation around your budget, but the finance minister ordered you not to. That put you in an invidious, almost impossible position, um, conflicted between two acts. But it was thought 10 years ago that could never happen. It was thought 10 years ago that all of your working draft papers were covered by parliamentary privilege and that there was no real question until Talis took you to court and that whole question was opened up, putting at risk pretty much all of the work you do then being subject to litigation by people who are grumpy with you and don't like your audit conclusions. So I suppose it worries me if we're thinking, oh, well, that could never happen because there's been a number of things which we thought could never happen that have happened. Yep. So while shared services, directions by the finance minister, all of these things so far you've managed to resolve by common sense, there could come a day when common sense doesn't work and puts you in an invidious position. So that's the independence of appearance you're talking about. Yes. Okay. I've got other questions, but if you want to go on yeah, independence I'll, for a while. I'm going, to, I'm going to ask Senator O'Sullivan, then so Senator themed, Chandler. Though. Well, it's, I think no, it's no, helpful, it's just good. because there's a lot in this. But before I do, um, Auditor General, uh, just for the committee's benefit, perhaps on notice, um, I note, I just wonder whether you might be able to provide some information, almost like a comparative. Um, so the PBO, for instance, um, and, and how what your proposal, how that would align with the current um, framework that the PBO sits in, that might be helpful for us, if that would be okay. Thank you. On notice, thank you. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you. Uh, thank you for appearing today. I'd like to ask you about the Mexico Declaration. I've got a number of questions about that, but can you just, just start by just giving us a description of what that is? Um, it's, th there's this organisation called InterSci, which is basically at the international organisation of audit officers. Um, and it, it largely sets up, it's a, sort of a self-regulating framework for audit officers in terms of establishing um, how standards for how they operate. And the Mexico Declaration was an, uh, an agreement, a, a set of terms that was agreed by that body, which, which is membership of all audit officers around the world, about what the fundamental principles are of an effective audit framework. Um, as you can imagine, there are a lot of the work of Indesci goes to how we can drive improvement in audit officers in countries with less robust accountability frameworks than Australia. So it forms a, a very strong set of principles that people can go back and assess how effective their legislative constitutional frameworks are. So it was set up in that framework. It was, um, it's been considered on a couple of occasions by the United Nations General Assembly and, and they've, uh, they've sort of endorsed it as a, an appropriate framework to be applied in assessing um, audit officers and it, it's used pretty much around the world through a, uh, there's also a framework underpinning that developed by InterSci called the Performance Management Framework which we use as an international community to sort of peer assess how each other's frameworks are going. I don't know whether that's enough yeah, no. description of it. And so there's, I've seen in your report, there's eight principles. Yes. Um, how closely is our framework emulating those eight principles? Um, Where that, are there any gaps? The report that 
uh, Mr Hill referred to, uh, which is an assessment of Australia, New Zealand and the state audit offices, is, an, is effectively against that framework. Um, our, our framework is pretty robust. It has the is issues where it has um, challenges against the framework tend to be in some of the areas covered by this submission. They, they go to how much the executive is involved in the appointment of uh, the Auditor General in the setting of the budget of the Auditor General and how expansive the mandate is. Um, they're, they're the sort of areas which the framework would pick up that we, we are challenged by. Okay, and so are there so are there specific things that that yeah where where there is a bit of a, a difference in in the application? Um, it's it's more a, a, a test rather than right. You, you can do comparative stuff. So to say that we're relatively weak isn't quite right. It's a it's a test of how you assess against um, and you know, the where what the things where. We are, uh, as I said, like in the appointment of the Auditor General, many, many jurisdictions are moving more towards the Parliament being the, the selection process rather than the executive being it. So um, under that assessment framework that we've included in, uh, that we've included as an attachment to the report, the, um, you've got jurisdictions where a committee such as this would run the selection process um, and then it would make the recommendation about who who should be appointed through either through the executive or through the the president um, speaker to executive council rather than mm. it coming the other way. So at the moment, you get a short list to pick from rather than in other jurisdictions you'd give the short list or maybe just make a single recommendation, and it's that sort of balance of perceptions of independence. Um, the, the extent to which uh, we, the extent to which under our framework the executive can um, override our mandate is stronger than in, in some other jurisdictions. That's the section 37 components, but also some of the other things we mentioned in the report around uh, the ability under the PGPA Act for the Minister for Finance to allow information to be excluded from our, report, our, our financial reports. So that sort of drags down the assessment okay. of us as, as being independent. And so is Australia a, a signatory we're a member? Of Intersight? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and is it a binding agreement or is it a, no, just a no. best practice? It's a, it's a best practice framework um, and the UN when it's endorsed it um, has said uses the type of language you would expect to the extent uh, endorses its implementation by countries to the extent it's consistent with their approach sort of thing so it's not binding it's a it's a self-regulatory framework um, an example is we're one of the few countries that has auditing standards uh, developed um, in which have a public sector focus most of the countries most countries around the world for public sector auditing use the intersize standards as the framework for um, for how they undertake auditing because it's a there are a set of auditing standards which are specifically been designed for public sector use yeah. and so intersize an organization international organization basically develops and maintains that standards framework and then does a lot of work in helping organizations achieve those standards, that type of things. So it's a it's sort of a collaborative international organisation. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Questions from Senator Chandler. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you all for appearing today. I have some questions around the mandate issues that you've highlighted um, both in your submission to us um, previously and your presentation today. You want to be able to. Uh, audit some GBEs, I see. Um, yeah, we do audit GBEs. Mm -hmm. The current arrangement is for us to undertake an audit of a GBE, uh, you have to ask us. Yes. And um, 
the Act specifically says that I can ask you to ask us, and we do that mm -hmm. uh, probably every... We've done that every year for about the last four years, mm -hmm. I think. And the committee's never said no, um, so thank you for that. But our view is, well, is that the, the, the world's changed since the whole framework around why we wouldn't be able to deal performance order of the GBE was put in place. It, it was established in a world where you had um, government business at enterprises like banks and airlines and things like that, which, act, which acted in a, a competitive, much more competitive world than a lot of the GBEs we have in now. Most of the GBEs in existence now do much more public purpose things. Mm -hmm. they, they get significant government equity to invest in things which wouldn't happen without the public sector putting the, the money in. Um, inland Rail, um, through Austrac, NBN, um, Defence Housing Authorities, mm -hmm. the, the Snowy now, mm -hmm. um, and like it acts in a competitive market, but a lot of its, its investment is now being driven by government. Western Sydney Airport, they're all public purposes, which I can't see why you'd have a restriction on us just being able mm. to do the audit of them. Our audits that we have done when you've agreed to, for us to do them or asked us to do them haven't found them any different from auditing other corporates yeah. in the public sector. And I, I don't have um, great knowledge of, of how this um, occurs at a federal level, but is there a legislative requirement on GBEs to obviously have an external audit undertaken each year, and I'm guessing the ANAO does not undertake that audit? No, that's that's the financial audit. Yes. So what we're asking about, we're asking for is a yes. respect to performance audits. We, yep. GBEs are required to undertake external audits by two acts. One's the Corporation Act mm -hmm. and the other is the, the PGPA Act. Yep. We're the mandated auditor under the PGPA Act, and they can select an auditor under the Corporations Act. They all select us as the auditor, otherwise they'd have to pay for two audits. Right. So we do we audit all of the we, we are mandated to audit all GBEs and we also are their um, Corporations Act auditor. Yeah. And is there any legislative requirement on GBEs to have internal audits undertaken, like um, a, a, um, a risk assurance function or the, or the like? Um, PGPA Act. No. 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 There are requirements for them to have audit committees, etc. And, and yeah. in common practice of audit committees, they establish programs of internal audit work. So yes. they do do internal audits around their own control frameworks and risks. Yes. And do they do do they undertake that internal audit function themselves, or do they outsource to a professional services firm? It depends on the entity. There's no there's no standard rule about that. Um, yeah. Some okay. some grow an internal audit function. Many. Uh, outsource it uh, yeah. to the private sector. So, in effect, what you're saying is that if the ANAO was able to, and and you're not saying that you want the authority to do them carte blanche, you just want the authority to initiate performance audits in the GBEs if in a GBE if you so wish to. Um, we we believe that we should independently be able to decide to audit do a performance audit of GBEs. Yes. Um, and because in most cases now GBEs are substantially using public yeah. equity to carry out their functions. Yeah. Um, that's right. Um, and, and there's no other... What, what I'm trying to get to is where is the gap? So is there no other requirement upon GBEs to get those performance audits done any other way currently? We're, we're the only external performance audit function in the Commonwealth. There, there isn't, there's no equivalent of performance audit undertaken in the private sector or anywhere else. It's, it's, it's a bespoke public sector thing. And it's done for the parliament. So mm -hmm. even, if, even if a GBE decided to get some sort of review done that kind of looked like a performance audit, yep. it's not for you, it's for them. True. So our function is to do an independent audit for the parliament at the moment, we have the mandate to do the financial audits mm -hmm. and uh, we're selected to do the Corporations Act audits. At the moment, the mandate that we have to do performance audit 
requires a couple of speed hump steps to get through rather than just be initiated automatically under the Act by the Auditor General. So it's, it's really bringing yeah. it into line with other Commonwealth sector entities. Yes. Can yeah. I ask a question of related course. to that? Why were those so-called speed humps put there in the first place? Can you help us understand the context for why they were established? They, they were established. The, the GBE framework was the GBE framework was developed in the um, 70s and 80s, predominantly in the 80s. This is my interpretation of history, okay, so there may be others. And the GBE framework was largely developed in the context where there was a significant number of privatisations going on, and the framework was to establish public sector entities to make them look like public companies in the context of privatisation. And so and it was largely built around, as I said before, things like airlines and banks and corporations of that ilk, um, which were operating in a competitive market. The argument that the government has put um, when responding to JCPAA um, recommendations that we get to the function is that it would be a competitive disadvantage to those businesses because their private sector competitors don't have the same overhead cost as a public sector performance audit that um, that they would have if this was to apply. And so when it was agreed to expand the mandate to include GBEs, uh, the speed hump was put in to basically say, well, this shouldn't be done willy-nilly. I don't know whether that's a technical term, but it should be done thoughtfully. Uh, my argument would be that the nature of GBEs is changing as well. Through, t through time and the circumstances today aren't equivalent to the circumstances in the past because most of our GBEs are undertaking activities which could have been undertaken through, say, a grant program or some other form of direct public expenditure, but they're being, which we would be able to audit. So um, if, for example, regional fast regional rail had been done through providing subsidies to private rail network to build the infrastructure, we'd be able to audit that. Um, similar to airport construction, if it was done that way, we'd be able to audit it, but the public funds are being directed into GBEs to develop effectively public infrastructure, and that sort of nexus is different from what it was previously, would be my argument. And one follow-up question, so, Senator mm, Chandler, is that okay? One follow-up question. Would you, Matt, if that was, um, if, if your view there was, uh, became a recommendation or that was something that uh, formed any conclusion of this committee, how would you then, just hypothetically, how would you then fit that into your current KPI in terms of numbers of performance audits, would that require additional funding? Is that something that you would see would be no. within the usual remit of the committee? How do you see that working? The way we've done it over the last few years, I made a decision on taking the role that I thought we weren't going into the GBE space um, actively enough. And over the last several years, the way we've dealt with it is I've written to the committee and said, I'd like you to request us to do these audits and the committee's always agreed, so it's been built into our program already. And so we, uh, this is about um, getting rid of that perception of lack of independence of, of the legislation saying that we can't do something unless someone else agrees to it. And, and the way we've gone into them is to look at particular aspects of their operation, um, just like we would do in any other uh, non-corporate um, entity like looking at the complaints handling in NBN or looking at the procurement in more bank, um, because more banks basically buying a lot of stuff to create. Um, the company's creating something, some infrastructure, and it's buying off other people. So we've been looking at the same aspects of public administration in the GBEs as we do in the non-corporate sector. Senator Chandler. Thank you. Just um, a couple more questions. Um, just relating to um, the acceptance or otherwise of audit recommendations by some of your entities. So I note in your submission you express concern that sometimes entities don't say whether or not they accept or reject your 
recommendations, and I certainly remember from uh, my time in professional services just how frustrating that can be. Is that really something that we need to look at from a legislative perspective, though? I mean, isn't there an argument that this should, or you know, it, it's a cultural journey that we should be taking the public service on to the point where they know that when they receive a report from you, it's you know, not oh, this is an interesting report, thanks for coming. They're, it's accept or reject and outline a plan of how they're going to achieve the recommendations you've suggested. Our concern with respect to this and we've, we've raised it with the committee before um, in a particular circumstance of an inquiry where um, the, a particular agency, when we asked them to say whether they agree or disagree, stated to us that the legislation didn't require it and they weren't going to say oh, so. Oh, right, okay. And that was discussed at this committee and the committee made a recommendation about the importance of doing it. Our concern is that we do reports for you, for the parliament, and we think it's appropriate for executive agencies when there are recommendations, and, and we're not, you might notice our reports don't have 20 recommendations. We try to bring it down to the three or four big things that we think an entity should do, and we work pretty hard with entities to get agreement on them, because if they don't agree, then what's of the course. point? Um, it's for the parliament, and we think it's reasonable for the parliament to expect that when we do a report and the, the entities had a chance to, to interact with it, to provide their comments, that they say precisely to the parliament what their view is on it, whether they agree or disagree. And um, because then you know what to expect from them going forward. And that, that's the perspective that we take from it. Um, and then they can be held to account for whether they do something or not on it. If they say agree in principle or agree noted, noted or mm -hmm. things like that, then we go back later and ask them what have they done and they say, no, oh, so we, we, never, really did, we never really agreed to do that yep. and that type of thing. So from our point of view, it's as much a, an issue of respect to the par of the parliament rather than the concern that we have in producing the report. Mm -hmm. Yep. Th thank you for that insight. I like I said, I would have thought that this wasn't necessarily something that required a, a, a legislative approach, that it, it could happen more organically than that. But if you've expressed the concern that previously it's been said to you that, yeah. well, legislation doesn't say I have to, so it, it, I won't, it then was, we'll consider. It did happen once, by right. the way, but, but we, we also have concerns about the a reasonably common approach is agree in principle and then a paragraph which explains why they're not going to do anything. Um, mm -hmm. but or agree I'm not with qualifications, yeah. and all the qualifications really mean don't agree. And right. so the transparency to the parliament is you would read it and go, oh, they agreed, that looks all good. If you actually mm -hmm. get behind it, they're not agreeing at all. And Sorry. so some clarity. Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, I, I do wonder how, from a legislative sense, I, we will... Um, <laughs> get something that achieves the outcome that you are looking for. But I, don't, I don't think you can do much about the commentary. Um, we push back very hard on that. And of course. I've got a policy of putting in a rejoinder to commentaries where they say they agree, but it looks like they don't, um, to try and make it clear to the parliament that it doesn't look like they're agreeing. Um, and we've been doing that to try and put pressure on entities to actually say what they think. Because mm -hmm. from our point of view, whether they agree or disagree, we'd prefer them to agree. But if they don't, be honest, upfront, clear yes. about it is the only perspective that we have on these things. Yes, because like you say, otherwise you'll go in years later and ask what happened to this audit recommendation and it's just fallen off a list somewhere. Or you will. I mean, or we will. That's yes. the thing. I mean, the, the interesting part about the response to the recommendations is it's a response to our work to you. Mm -hmm. uh, to the parliament. It's not, they're not accountable to us. Mm -hmm. um, they're executive government accountable to the parliament. Yes. And that's why we try to massage these things through so clearly, to make sure that the accountable authorities are quite clear that what they're saying, they're saying to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Chandler. A question, Senator Patrick. Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> that's the, the old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, in that context, uh, and I note that um, that Mr Hill, is, uh, the, the Deputy Chair, has indicated one area we've had difficulty 
from uh, with the conflict bet between the executive and the parliament. Uh, what other examples can you give that give rise to a concern in relation to your independence, um, either nuanced or, or um, actual examples? Um, I, th I think the, the issues um, with respect to independence are the ones that we've set out in the um, submission, and they, they do. I, with respect to the, the ANAO being an executive agency, uh, I think it's a, as we've said, it's a perception rather than actionality generally, um, and so ap apprehended rather than actual. It, it's constantly having to re-educate people that we're not the internal auditor for the executive, which is a challenge that we face pretty regularly. But that's I'm not certain how much that changes. Um, but I am reasonably confident that if we were establishing the audit office today, um, after the PBO has been established in a certain form, I, I doubt if we would have been established in the way we have been now. I think the uh, we were established before the, the framework for parliamentary departments in its current form came into effect. Um, before there was sort of a separation of, um, I think this is right, parliamentary staff, the staff of parliamentary departments from the the public sector generally with the, the Act. Mop, mop, the MOPS Act. Uh, not MOPS, no, parliamentary the Parliamentary Services. Act. 1999. So our, our, our office has been um, obviously around since 1901 in various forms. Um, it's mostly been in the Prime Minister's portfolio. Uh, originally started in Treasury. We had a brief uh, sojourn into finance uh, and brought back into PM and C. So we've always been um, an agency within executive government, albeit with this very close relationship with the parliament. And I think some of the things that we've been talking about, perhaps a little esoterically, <laughs> Senator Patrick, is some stronger optics around the relationship between the audit office and the parliament which it serves. Um, it does get confusing out there. People do think that we're auditing for management. We're not. Management's the executive. We're auditing for the parliament. Um, the PGPA Act, a, a classic example was when it, when it passed, it removed the Auditor General's ability to table his own annual report uh, and brought it back into the framework of PGPA to be tabled through a minister. Now, when we approached PMNC and said, do you really want that? They said, no, no, and it was restored into the Act. So out, uh, writ large out there, uh, the executive thinks of us as an agency, that's an executive agency, except when we hit the road running and table a report. And some of the, the optics get confusing, um, and we want to make it much more clear that our function that we deliver under our Act is for the parliament. I seem to recall there was an FOI decision that um, was made in respect of the diff the, uh, um, whether or not the Auditor General was, was FOIable, but the ANA uh, yeah, or the ANAO as a, a separate entity. So Anyone recall that? Going. Yes, there was. So, so there was a decision, um, and it was a decision of the Information Commissioner in a matter called Brett Goyne, um, which confirmed that the entity is exempt, even though the schedule says Auditor General. Yeah. Um, and it confirmed that to the extent that not only are our audit papers exempt, but all of our administration papers are exempt as well. Um, for, for very good public policy reasons, that what we hold uh, for auditing purposes is both confidential and uh, we're custodians for other people's stuff. And it's subject to privilege, presumably, as well. Yes. They went a bit... bit um they went a bit more extensive. The Information Commissioner said our administrative stuff wasn't subject to FOI be on the basis that it's too hard to con split the split two, things two things apart. Mm. So we act as if our administrative issues are subject to FOI. Mm. And so if people ask us for that information, we just give it <coughs> to them. But So the decision has made it clear, but yeah. uh, the, the way it's structured at the moment in, in some sense gives weight to the evidence you've given that there's uh, perception or a difficulty? Yeah. There, okay. there is a small difficulty that we outline in the submission, and that's when our, um, 
our documents are held elsewhere. Mm. So it's very clear where an applicant comes under FOI to, to us um, that we can say, we don't do FOI around here, we're exempt under Schedule 2 of the FOI Act. It becomes less clear uh, where, for example, our report preparation papers, we write issue papers to, to iterate with the entity that we're auditing, and they might get an FOI request. And whether or not our exemption carries through to others is, is an unclear area that we've addressed in the report. I, I think it is actually reasonably clear in that it is in the possession of the department, the other department. And I say that with some experience in this particular area. Sorry, with some experience, with a great deal. Yeah. With a great deal of experience. Yeah, yeah, an achievement of <laughs> I think the, I think the, well, the, the issue that you were FOIing in the Hawkey thing was a, was a document that we that I'd given. It wasn't an RP. It wasn't working papers. It was a report. And that's oh, slightly I'll, different, I think. I'll come back to that, but I'll give you another example. When this committee was conducting the Section 37 hearing, I FOI'd the auditor, the Attorney General, yeah. and received letters and correspondence that had come from the the Auditor General. Yeah. So, so in that instance, uh, your letters were in fact FOI liable because they were in the possession of a uh, of, of a department. So, yeah. I, I just make that observation. Coming back to section 37, um, what, what's, what's your remedy to this? Uh, I, I seem to recall it was, it's, it's that the committee should, if, if the, auditor, uh, the Attorney General issues a certificate, the committee ought to be able to, to see the full report in camera. Is that the, the, the summary of where you're recommending that go? I, I I think there, um, then, I think that may be right, but I, I'd, I'd leave the technical details of that for drafters to be to, to deal with. It, it seems to me that in the national security space, the Parliament has arrangements with the executive to make sure that uh, the Parliament is briefed on what's going on in a, in a lot of areas. That's roughly right. Um, I think, isn't it? Well, uh, it's just a case of in that instance... Uh, Sorry, but more broadly than that, there's, there's generally an arrangement between the executive and the parliament about how to deal with sensitive issues in an in-camera framework. In this case, that, that is completely taken away, and it also has the other effect that, um, for example, let's say there was an in-camera process happening and um, there was a report that had a certificate applied to it and information was provided to the parliament and you had a hearing in confidence with respect to it. I couldn't come along to this hearing, to that hearing and make any commentary on the issues that were covered by the certificate. Because it's specifically prohibited in the provisions. Yes. Uh, uh, but that's, uh, I guess, so... If, if you said, OK, the Attorney-General has, has uh, issued a certificate, therefore you can't publish particular information in your audit report, um, the, the idea would be that the committee might hold that in camera and that those provisions might need to be removed in, in that those circumstance. circumstances. Yeah, I think that's one element to it. I think, so it, the continuum goes from... Sorry? It did happen, yes. Okay, happen. Well, what we'll do is we'll just have the Auditor General yeah. respond and then a question from Senator O'Sullivan. The continuum goes from the committee understanding the nature of what has been taken out and the detailed reasons for it through to the committee having some in-camera access to the information that has been um, excluded. Yeah. And I'm down the end of the committee should at least have some in-camera access to the information that's been excluded, but at the very least, there should I would think there should be much clearer um, description to the Parliament of what is what's the nature of the information that's been re removed and why. Sure, and, and so in this instance, and I know you're not going to answer this question, but in this oh. instance, the uh, uh, the audit the audit did not. You could not 
or sorry, there was an absence of any, any finding as to whether or not the procurement was value for money. That's a statement of fact. That's correct. Okay. And, but you couldn't answer, for example, if I said to you, was it a, um, what, what was that particular no. procurement a uh, you know, value for money? No. That, that's no, no, I, you can't answer I that I can't answer that question. Okay. So that's an example of, of, of a problem. And that's a fundamental output of a, an audit, isn't it? That's why that audit didn't have a conclusion, because the Attorney General certificate removed one part of the aggregate conclusion, which was material to the whole conclusion. So I decided that in technical terms we put a disclaimer on it, um, because I couldn't just I couldn't put the conclusion with the blanked out bit in there, because you wouldn't know what the entirety of what we found was, because there's a bit missing. So. You can't, you can't edit a conclusion like that and have it mean anything. So we really do have to remedy this because the public are entitled to know what the what the findings, the fundamental findings of the audit are. Yeah. Well, Patrick, it's also worth noting that those restrictions on the Auditor General to comment that you've just experienced again. Yes, yeah. Um, also apply where the Auditor General um, decides to omit information under Section 37 in, uh, for public interest reasons as set out there. Sure, no, I understand and, that. And again, um, that limits uh, the Parliament's ability to uh, inquire of certain areas that he's made that decision under. So, so he could also brief you in camera if there was room on audits where he's made the public interest opinion to omit information. Sure. Um, or I'll just, just maybe add this as a comment and a question at the end. Today at 12 o'clock Adelaide time, the decision in my AAT matter uh, will be released, um, and that relates to whether or not the Attorney General, um, uh, the, the Attorney General's judgment was poor or not, that in effect uh, I think I'm very confident the report will be released to me today. In those circumstances, if I bring that report into this committee and then table it, because it uh, has been public released under, a, un, under FOI, I presume you still can't comment about Correct. it? No. Even though, even though I've obtained it under FOI? That's correct. And it's in the public domain, yeah. and I can table it in this committee. 12.30 today, so you're right. Right. <laughs> Twelve thirty today. Uh, uh, yes, that decision is handing down. I'll, I'll probably share it with you, Chair, Deputy Chair. I'm sure we'll all hear about it. You will. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you uh, Senator Patrick, Senator O'Sullivan, and then oh, a question it's from it's Deputy right, Chair. It's then it's back to Dr. Subsequent question is clarified mine. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, just a Deputy Chair. Uh, sort of, I don't know. It's a process question, perhaps a request. There's there's a huge amount in this. Is it possible? Um, over the next few weeks just to prepare two tables for us, just to help us kind of keep the issues. Um, one table might be just on section 37 because there's a lot of complexity in that and um, I think Senator Patrick and I were the only two members who sat through that inquiry last term. Um, it's, quite, it is a, it's actually quite a simple report but I'd encourage anyone who wants to get across it to read the Auditor General's submission to that inquiry because it had some very specific recommendations for change but it might be helpful if it was possible to organise those suggestions into a table with what's the suggestion and what's the rationale, because I, th I think it might be easier. And then more broadly, um, I think Senator Chandler's questions about mandate um, uh, and a few of the others, it might be helpful if it was possible to get a table organised that effectively put your submission, you don't have to repeat all the words, but just what are the specific suggestions yeah, okay. And where possible, that they could be themed. So we could think about mandate. We can yeah. think about your appointment. We can think about um, the privilege issues. So it would be a structured way for us to work through those. Um, and I'd be interested in any supplementary comment. You know, it's a silly, silly way to think about it, maybe. But we're currently sitting seventh out of ten on the league table of Australian and New Zealand auditors general. You know, what would we need to do to put ourselves back towards sort of the top couple of spots, because everyone else will play leapfrog in the next 10 yeah. years. Are the recommendations then you put out in your table, are they going to get us back there? Is that kind of what we should be looking at? Um, we can probably take a guess at what the those things would do, because the, the framework that is used for it's pretty easy to apply. Sure. So we can have a go at that. Um, um, so that was my process suggestion. I've got some other thematic things, okay, but I just think that would help us. Hold there. Um, the Auditor General would like to make a comment, and then I'm going to 
Doc, oh, sorry, to, to uh, Senator O'Sullivan, then Dr Lee. Auditor General. I, I just wanted to, since we're talking a bit before about Section 37, the committee in the past has been interested in when we've been approached on Section 37. So in the last few months, we've been approached twice to, I've been approached and asked to remove issues on the basis of 37 twice. Um, one's in a, was in respect to a report that's coming out in this week or next week where I, where it's set out that I was approached and asked to do it um, in the health portfolio and the other was in the defence portfolio. Um, on both occasions, I said I didn't think they were Section 37 related issues but did make some adjustments because some of the information they said they didn't want released wasn't particularly material to the conclusion. So I made a judgment. Um, Part of the issues that the Deputy Auditor General was referring to before around this is, and I said in my opening statement I'm reluctant to use 37, is because as soon as I, I say I'm going to take something out under Section 37, I effectively gag the office from ever talking about the issue. And that's a really big step for us because the committee might do an inquiry into something and have some reasonable questions and um, I could be sitting here and the the department may say something which isn't quite consistent with the evidence that we've got, and I can't say a word about that because it's a complete and utter gag on ever talking about it once we use 37. And that means from my, the more I consider it, the less likely I am to actually use, formally use 37. I, I, I regularly exclude information and don't put it in, but to formally do so under the Act is just such a significant impact on our ability to support the parliament that it's, I don't think it's that effective so at the moment. Who, maybe you can answer this theoretically, who approaches you? The, well, it's usually in the context of our section 19 report when we give them a draft and right. the department writes back and says, we think under section 37, you, B, A, whatever. So that's you should... typically the trigger when you give them yeah. the draft. Okay. Sometimes they, they raise issues in the report preparation papers, but our pushback then is, well, they're an expansive set of work information where we put everything on the table. We haven't got to the point of what we're going to include in the report, so it's yeah. usually at section 19. Just before you go, can I just ask on that? Um, one of the concerns in the inquiry last term was that the actions of defence and the Attorney General in that instance may have a chilling effect yeah. because agencies who I think in years you'd never had anyone raise Section 37 like yeah. In all the audits you'd done in the first three or four years in your time in the role, no one had ever walked into your office and said Section 37. And then all of a sudden there was a set of litigation and it was used and you had a number of agencies start to say, oh, we don't like that, we, we might apply for Section 37. Yeah. So is it your practice, given you've raised this, to mention requests for Section 37 in your audit reports? Um, well, no. Right. Um, but it has been my practice to tell the committee when it has happened and that's why so I raised you, it here. you just mentioned a health and a defence audit. If I picked up those audits when they're tabled, will I find mention of that? I'm in mean, the health one, you will, not in the defence one. Right. Um, yeah. uh, question from Senator O'Sullivan. Just a quick one. Just with regards to the possibility of having ANAO as a department, um, I, I get that I get what you're trying to fix, like the, you know, the independence um, aspect of it. Um, but are there other ways that it can be achieved without creating you know, a separate department? I, you know, without having looked at it deeply, I would have thought that creating a department would add to it extra layers of complexity and, uh, and cost in particular uh, that would actually take away from your ability to perform the audit program that you're committed to? We're a separate entity already, so it makes it will be no substantive change in the administrative structure of the organisation. Okay. So it's shifting us from being an entity in under the with employment arrangements under the Public Service Act to an entity with employment arrangements under the Parliamentary Services Act and shift the portfolio where the entity sits from being under an e executive portfolio into the parliamentary portfolio of, of entities, effectively. And, and is there anything like, you know, that, that, that's your sort of wish list, that's what you'd like to, or that you're recommending we look at. 
Um, but is there anything within the current framework that could be done to actually strengthen the independence, other than creating another department? Um, there's the there's issues around how the budget's set and the relationship yeah. between and the Parliament yeah. and the executive on our setting of the budget goes to some of that. Issues there's other issues in here like how the appointment of the auditor general is undertaken. Um, if if we were a parliamentary department similar to the PB, the Parliamentary Budget Officer, it would go more through the, the Parliament and the uh, presiding officers rather than through the executive, so that would change that perception of independence. Um, it, there could be changes to some elements of the PGPA to make it clear that um, our reporting, f like one of our concerns in the, in the current arrangement is under the PGPA Act, the Minister and Minister for Finance can request any any papers and reports office. Um, there could be amendments in, in that space to deal with some of those things. So there, there, are, there are amendments that could be yeah. made to go along the route. Yep. Okay. And most of them are set out in the paper mm. in our mm. submission. Uh, Dr Lee. Uh, apologies if for uh, arriving a little late. I was doing a kid drop off this morning and uh, this may have been an issue that was covered before. Uh, what's your capacity to deal with large size data sets? I mean, most of the analysis that you do seems to have kind of, seems to be the kind of N of 100 or N of 200. Uh, but to the extent that you are looking at issues in the social security space, you could well find yourself uh, dealing with patterns that would be, uh, have confidentialised data sets in the millions. Do you have? many staff that can run a regression, that can use R or Stata, uh, that have the ability to, to comfortably dive into, into really big sized data sets? Yeah, we've, we've invested quite a lot in our data analytics team over the last few years be, because that's where da data is now, big data, you know, you know well, large data sets, and that's where a lot of our work is undertaken. So we're... We have, a, we have a specialist data analytics team. Um, in terms of capacity of um, computing space, et cetera, we're all cloud and we're all protected cloud. Computer's easy. Yep. Exactly. We haven't had difficulty, uh, unlike some agencies recruiting um, specialised data staff. Uh, it is an area of investment that we've made since 2016. Um, the interesting thing is that um, our capacity to run it isn't a problem. Um, and we're, we're, you've obviously pointed to the, the, the data sizing. We, we actually run samples that meet our standards. We, we also, uh, perhaps slightly differently to the Ombudsman's Office, we don't redo casework. So we're actually looking for patterns and trends mm -hmm. rather than outcomes in individual cases. And we haven't had a problem. I think our only, our only issue is the time it takes to extract at the other end. It's the extraction side that's the timely side. We set the parameters and we rely on the entity to do the extraction for us. But um, performing the procedures on it, we've been blessed with um, a, an extremely strong capability. So how many people would you have who could run a regression? Uh, we've, got, we, we've got 30 staff in our, um, in, our, in our group that does that and IT audit work and they can interchange between them because they can also test IT controls and things like that. So there's about half a dozen that are completely data anal uh, analysis staff and they work for both um, performance auditing and financial auditing because we do quite a bit of work behind the scenes in financial auditing as well. It, um, it's, as Deputy Auditor General said, it's an issue we're investing more in. With respect to data, um, one of the, one of the things that we looked at in the context of this review was our, with respect to our mandate and powers is our ability to, to get to all data sets and the big challenge there that a lot of entities are facing is around um, encrypted communication data sets and um, our, we think we have the legislative power to do that. The issue is in the practicability of doing it. So it's probably not a matter for this committee, but it, I, I suspect at some point um, we've got a, an Archives Act that says all public information needs to be maintained and then communication channels that, are, that people are using, which include official records, which don't automatically maintain the record. 
and make it inaccessible. And what's the examples? WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Um, yeah, those type of things. And what's WhatsApp? That's a joke. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> and the the issue for the Parliament and, and the executive at some point is going to be whether you those types of communication channels are allowed. If if they don't create a record and records are required, then how can you actually allow the use of those type of communic communication channels within executive government? Is, is a question I would have thought. Mm. Because all data is becoming unstructured more think, and more. I, I think so. that's where I'd, I'd like to go. The, the sort of analysis that I imagined um, when you were talking, um, for example, like in social services, quite structured data. Mm. It, mm. It's held against a, a registration, it's held against a legislative function, it's structured in a system. There might be some free text in it, but it's generally a structured record. Our, our biggest effort at the moment in data analytics is to wade through, and which we do in an automated way, unstructured data, uh, because we find that record keeping in departments is highly reliant on email. So rather than being neatly filed back in the day where you would you know, and end up in a compactor sin and whatever, mm -hmm. These days, even though there are electronic record keeping systems, we're having to take terabytes of outlook um, from entities um, by name and uh, bring it into our um, forensic analysis systems and sort of structure the, the requests, the searches that we're making because so much is unstructured and free text. Mm. Uh, and that, that's been quite a big investment <laughs> um, because we've found otherwise our field work time in performance audits becomes quite elongated because the entities can't find the data themselves. And then we structure it and mm. use it in the evidence. Just going back to what you were saying, Auditor General, briefly, um, it was a very broad observation. Are you indicating that you mean this for agencies? Uh, are you indicating you mean this for What's Parliament? Are you indicating you mean um, this for ministers? Uh, can you be more specific with we, what you were we, expressing your preference with? Uh, my preference is probably too strong. I was making an observation about the, um, the intersect between an Archives Act that says all record, you have to maintain all records and the use of um, communication elements which don't create records. And for us, that, that covers the, the, uh, the things that we audit, which are executive government, where we're trying to find records of things. Um, and you know, the path we've gone down is we, we go into emails, um, as the Deputy Auditor General said, as a key data source. Um, it's leading us to question the extent we need to go into text messaging to find out the issue of the evidence of how decisions were made, because that becomes that they're, they're all records um, at the end of the day. If you if you send a text message to someone saying let's do this, then it's a record which should be maintained. And text messages you can access because they are maintained somewhere. But if you get to uh, communication where where records are more challenging to keep, then there's an observation I'm making is there's an issue between the Archives Act and the, the procedures of individuals in how you maintain the records. Because a WhatsApp chat around the processes of executive government are records and they should be maintained and held on the record. Um, questions from Senator Scott? Uh, just a few quick ones. Uh, now, we, we don't want to contemplate life after you, Mr Hare, that there will be a recruitment process at one stage or another in terms of your successor. Uh, and we went through this process with the Parliamentary Budget Officer, and which was um, an education for me anyway in terms of how that works. And I'm just, I want to ask you a few questions about this just in the context of uh, independence benefits, in particular in relation to that recruitment process. In relation to the Parliamentary Budget Officer, the President and Speaker were actually key yes. in, in terms of that process. So they set up a selection committee, they chose the members of that selection committee, that selection committee then managed a process yeah. to get applications from uh, people who were interested in the positions, generated a short list, 
the President and Speaker were engaged in terms of looking at that short list, had interviews, and then they made a formal uh, they made a decision effectively, the President and the Speaker made a final decision and then at the back end of the process the President and the Speaker addressed this committee and said well this is a process we went through, uh, this is our recommendation and it was uh, explained quite emphatically to us by, uh, especially by the Speaker, this is your choice, either accept or reject, that's all you can yeah. do. Uh, and I'm just reflecting on that process and, and what would maybe be um, the best process for this position because it just strikes me that the interaction between you and this committee is just far more, uh, well, it's a, it's a detailed interaction in depth. So you'd be working with or advising this committee or or providing material which is overseen by this committee or commented on far more than you would to the President and the Speaker, yeah. it seems to me. So um, I'm just wondering if maybe a recruitment process, given that background, should more properly involve maybe the Chair and the Deputy Chair of this committee doing what the President and the Speaker did in relation to the Parliamentary Budget Officer in, in making a recommendation of accept or reject. Uh, to the President and the, uh, and the Speaker. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, firstly, I think a process uh, which has the Speaker and um, President is preferable to one that we have at the moment, which is the, uh, a process run through the Prime Minister's right. Department. So, th so that would be an improvement, that, that step improvement. change. So then the question is, should so the President and Speaker be the ones doing the accept or reject recommendation or should it be, the, say, the Chair and the Deputy Chair? The, my understanding of the, the model in Victoria is that the equivalent of the JCPAA runs the recruitment process and then makes a recommendation up through the, the Chair and the Speaker and President equivalent. My recollection of that is because I sat on a, a panel that the committee established down there to to select, make yep. a selection at one point. Um, so there is precedent for that that process yep. being in place, and there's, I I can't see why that wouldn't be a reason for doing way of, of moving it through. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then the only other question I have is, uh, what's the and I'm sure you've thought about this, uh, the implications for your staff of transitioning to becoming a parliamentary department. What does that mean for your for your staff as they transition from the arrangements they're currently under to uh, to your office becoming a, a parliamentary department? Does it have any implications? Um, they, they move from one act to another. Their terms of employment would stay the same under the enterprise agreement as far as I'm aware. The, right. There's full mobility between employees between the two acts, okay. so, so they're not disadvantaged any, in any way. There shouldn't be any disadvantage. We've got staff in our office that were previously uh, in the secretariat of this committee and, and a very easy transfer process yeah, we, and we, we transfer we, people the other way. So it shouldn't deny them future opportunities no. or... Okay. 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 Thanks. So Our questions from uh, Deputy Chair and I'll just flag we have five minutes. Okay. Um, just two things. Paragraph 38 and 39 you talk about um, the process by which your budget's set. Um, and I think you said here, I'll quote, the current system is effective where there are no changes to the ANAO's budget, but there are risks when there have been late budget changes, such as in 2018 and the conflict that then arose. I think the submission says that you were told by the Treasurer, I think it was actually the Finance Minister. No, it was the Treasurer. It was the Treasurer. It was the Treasurer, wasn't it? Okay. Um, and you said that we may wish to consider if we've currently got an appropriately well-defined role by in informing the executive of the parliament's views of the resourcing requirement. Um, without breaking committee privilege, we've obviously given this some thought and um, the current act allows us to make representations to the prime minister, but it sets no timeline or process. It's kind of permissive rather than prescriptive. Are you suggesting particular changes or is it more about how we go about it? Because it doesn't seem to be a legislative barrier. I think the the current framework sort of sets out a an engagement, an information sharing process rather than a, a really clear engagement process. And 
Um, so it could be done administratively, um, but the it's about getting the timing right on all of these things, um, I would have thought. So, and it's about the committee having a, a clear role how it perceives its its approach. Now, at one end you've got, there, there are jurisdictions where the, the budget of the office is determined by the parliament or a committee such as this and then given to the executive to consider rather than the other way round because the current arrangement is the executive set a budget, I tell you what the executive has set for the budget and then you form a view on it. In other jurisdictions it goes in opposite direction. Um, I don't know how that would work within our framework but it, it is a, a possibility that um, and that therefore the executive needs to make a decision to change it rather than sort of it reverses the onus. I'm not certain how that would sit within our constitutional framework. At the very least, we, we could tidy up our processes yeah. by setting some timelines and steps. Okay, that's yeah. good. Um, you haven't you haven't made as part of your submission any um, suggestion about the quantum of your budget. It's not really related to the legislation. I yeah, that's what I thought until the Prime Minister told us in question time that we were reviewing your budget through this process. So perhaps he was um, spinning it or misinformed, to be polite. Perhaps given the interest of time, uh, we might be able to well, take it's an important, up. Yeah, well, no, it's, it's an important question. The Prime Minister stood up in question time after um, not giving the Auditor General the money he asked for and said that this review was going to deal with the budget issues, which is patent yeah. nonsense. The terms of reference do not require us to deal with the budget issues. They talk about governance of resourcing, so I was making the direct point that the Auditor General has read the terms of reference, unlike the Prime Minister, and has not given us a budget submission. The so one, the one the relationship that That's I comment. would say is about, with respect to funding, is an issue which did, I think Senator Carr, did you raise with me at estimates about the, yes. the extent to which we are funded through fees rather than... Correct. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's covered in the submission. Yeah. I'm, I'm just mindful of the, the, time, the time. The last issue that I just wanted to touch on was the issue of oh, privilege. Sorry, just so you're just touching on that as a way of sort of maybe picking it up as a future, part of future is... Well, I'm making the point okay. that what the Prime Minister thought we were doing is clearly not what so we're it, doing. It's, it's not in terms okay, of thanks. reference. And it's good the Auditor General read the terms of reference, unlike the Prime Minister. Um, in relation to privilege, um, you've made, just if you could put on the record, because we're just trying to seed the key topics, I think, in this introductory hearing, um, the issue of parliamentary privilege, it had always been thought that all of the work of your office, not just the final report, but the draft report, the papers you collect, the studies you commission, the analysis you commission, is covered by privilege and therefore people can't go and sue you if they don't like what you're up to. Yep. Um, tell us the defence contractor shocked us all by taking into the federal court and threatening to go all the way to the high court to undo this application of privilege to your work. Um, what in essence are the key things that you think we could be looking at to put this beyond doubt? Because it, it brings down the whole edifice of what you do if you're not covered by privilege. What, what we say in this report, in our submission, is that there could be some note inserted to make a comment, something along the lines, to, to make it beyond doubt Right. This means this, and the purpose of that would be to um, prevent the delaying of a report by someone taking us to court and then debating the issue. It, it yep. would, it may facilitate the um, the process, may stop the process from happening, or if it did start, may facilitate it being dismissed quickly. Is is the okay. issue there? So that that could be a, a minor clarification of the Privileges Act to put it beyond doubt, for instance. That's right. The other privilege issue we raise is is an issue that uh, Senator Patterson's raised on a number of occasions about the interface between our Act and privilege with respect to um, ministers and their staff and their privilege and how our work. It's. Under our Act, we have a judicial function, and the judicial function is when when we uh, require people to give evidence under oath. Right. And the question is, that he raises is is raised is whether there should be some form of MOU between us and the Parliament about how that is carried out. Right. Um, and he raised it at estimates, and I said that might be something that this review should pick up, and I'm just raising it here to to be 
get clear, it on the agenda. Get it on the agenda the because yeah. so it'll come back in the table. Yes. Yes. Excellent. I, I Thank knew you. the deputy chair wants I love the, table. the table. All right. Well, uh, just uh, given that it is 9:30, I'd like to thank uh, representatives of the ANAO for coming today. Uh, if you have taken questions on notice or have been asked to provide additional information, could you please forward it through to the secretariat by Friday, the 22nd of January 2021? And if the committee has further questions, and I will flag, there are further questions that will be provided to you in writing at the conclusion of this hearing. They will, these will be sent through to you um, through the Secretariat. Can I thank you for your time? Can I thank all members present for their time? And I declare this public hearing closed. Uh, thank you very much. And the committee is adjourned. The committee, we've already done that bit. Yeah, thank you.